Hello, my friends. I hope your Sabbath is going well. Thank you for tuning in. This is part two of a three-part series that I have entitled, At His Feet, Having a Merry Heart, M-A-R-Y, Heart, because we are looking at some stories uh, uh, of uh, Mary of Bethany and the times that she found herself at the feet of Jesus. And when she did, each time amazing things happened. So we are in part two. And, uh, and so I, I would just invite you to uh, pause with me and we'll have a short word of prayer as we uh, embark here. Lord in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we can spend together. I pray that uh, this time will be sweet, that it will be encouraging, it will uh, be insightful, and that your spirit will lead. And we thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's have a little fun as we get started here. Ladies, Ladies, when was the last time your husband gave you a really good foot massage? Did he ever give you one? Well, if it's been a while, I'm going to help you a little bit, okay? Uh, in, in the past couple of weeks, I've learned more about feet than I ever wanted to know in this series. For instance, did you know that women are four times more likely to have problems with their feet than men are? Yeah, I mean, that could have something to do with the fact that 9 out of 10 women wear shoes that are too small for them. 9 out of 10. If you're one of those women, you might, it, it could be because you're, you're shopping at the wrong time of the day. Apparently, the best time to buy shoes is in the afternoon because that's when your feet are the most swollen from walking around all day. So, do your shopping. Uh, in the afternoon for your shoes, all right? But even if you do wear the right-sized shoes, your feet are still likely to be sore, ladies. Sore by the end of the day because women are typically on the go more than men are. Now, these aren't my words, you guys. I mean, they're proven, scientifically supported, erroneous studies that I picked up on the Internet, so you know that they're true. All right. And these studies, anyway, claim that the average woman will walk three more miles than the average man per day. Can you believe that? I can believe it. I'm married to one like that. So there you go. Women, you just remind your husband of those little facts tonight, and, I, and, and I've practically handed you a foot massage. No extra charge for that one. But that got me to thinking, if any woman in the New Testament knew something about sore feet, it would be Martha. It just had to be her. Martha was always on the go. Now, last week we met Mary and Martha, these two sisters, who had opened their home to Jesus and his 12 traveling companions. And while Martha had been on her feet all day, taking care of business, you know, as a good host, Worried and upset over all the preparations for their guests, Mary found herself kneeling at the feet of Jesus, cherishing his every word. At his feet, Mary had discovered the one thing that mattered most in life, and that was knowing and, and fostering intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. That was it. And Jesus told Martha, that that would not be taken away from her. He wasn't going to say, Mary, get up off your feet and go help your sister. No, because she had discovered the one thing that was most important. So this morning, what we're going to do is follow Mary to the feet of Jesus once again. Only this time, she isn't there cherishing his words, as we saw last week. This time, she's at his feet, as I have put it, sharing her burden. She's sharing her burden, and that'll unfold as we spend this time together. Jesus was currently across the Jordan River, where John the Baptist had been baptizing in the early, earlier days. When he receives word that his friend Lazarus, who is, of course, the brother of Mary and Martha, uh, he was very ill. And word comes to Jesus because they were very close. We're in John 11 today, and there it says in verses 6 and 7, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. 
Huh, so after two days and 20 miles uphill on foot over Rocky Mountain in the sweltering heat, Jesus and his, fathers, his followers finally arrive outside of Bethany, and they're really late. Before they can even reach the city, though, uh, they, they can hear flutes of, of, of psalms pouring out from the broken hearts of the people who were grieving. Jesus was too late. Lazarus had already died. The mourners wail with strained voices and, and tear-stained faces. Everyone Every one of them dotted with ash and dust from head to toe. It was their, their uh, custom, it was their culture to do that as they mourned the death of someone. It's sobering, to say, to say the least, what Jesus and those who were with him witnessed. There they were, all those people bereaved and covered with ash, beating their chests, ripping their clothes, uh, wailing in gut-wrenching sorrow and broken in grief. Martha was the first one to greet Jesus. She heard that he was coming and she went out to meet him again, ever the hostess. Martha's a strong one. You know, she, she handled all the funeral arrangements, I'm sure. She selected the flowers. She picked the, picked the plot <laughs> or the tomb, you know. She, she contacted the local rabbi. Hardly had time to grieve. Doesn't quite seem over to her. And she's right. And then out comes Mary, right? And it says in verse 32, when Mary uh, arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Our hearts go out to her, don't they? I mean, Mary knew exactly where she needed to be during her time of, tra of tragedy. And it's the same place God wants you and me to be during our own, you know, uh, personal times of sorrow and of grief. He wants us to be at the feet of Jesus. That's where we should run. And as we learned last week's, in last week's message, amazing things happen at his feet. But before Mary could discover the power and the compassion of Christ, that if you know this story, you can see it later, before she could experience that, she first had to discover what we're going to call the pain of calamity. She had to experience that pain of calamity, and she needed to know where to lay it, right? Her brother was dead. Her brother, who she loved. Let me just paint a little picture for you. As I, as I prepared this message, I, I got to thinking. I got to imagining. Never again would she see his crooked smile. Never again would she hear the laughter from him that, that used to echo down those cobblestoned hallways in their, in their stonewalled home, you know. It just echo all over the place. She re remembered his his laughing. Never again would she tell him to get his dirty feet off the coffee table, you know, that Martha uh, always kept so clean before Martha catches him. You know, like any of us would be, Mary was in pain. Actually, that's an understatement. She was in agony. I mean, she was falling apart. And, and, and what was it she said back in verse 32 when she fell at Jesus' feet? Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Oddly, as different as those two sisters were, the exact same words essentially slipped out of Martha's mouth only moments earlier. I kind of passed over that until now. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And then there were the muttered comments of the, and the hushed whispers of the extended family and friends. Over in verse 37, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? I really wonder how those words affected Jesus. Did, did they roll off his back, you know, because he knew what was coming? Or maybe they cut like a knife. You know, maybe they 
pierced his soul. I mean, he had chosen not to be there to save the day. And he knew he could have. He received word that Lazarus was on his deathbed, and then he intentionally waited two, two whole days before even leaving for Bethany in Judea. Now, to be fair, Jesus waited two days and then had a two-day trip. So, you know, by the time he arrived, Lazarus had been dead essentially four days. That's what they told him, which means Lazarus had died right about the time that Jesus got word that he was sick. But still, Jesus knows the beginning from the ending. He could have headed out to be there, at least to be there soon after his friend had died. But he chose not to be there. He arrived too late. And everybody's asking, where were you? Why weren't you here? You know, why didn't you do anything? How could you have let this happen? Have you ever looked up to heaven and, uh, you know, looked up into the sky and asked that very same question? Where were you, God? How could you have let this happen? Why didn't you do something about it? There's so much calamity. There's so much catastrophe. There's so much chaos in this world. Bad things happen to good people all the time, don't they? Have you ever felt like God had forgotten you? Just forgotten or neglected. Maybe you're dealing with the death of someone you love, you know, or some other tragedy that's, that's taken you by surprise. Maybe you've lost a job over something that was no fault of yours, but now you're, you know, the one suffering for it. Maybe you've been praying and praying and praying for God to work a miracle in your marriage, but it just never seems to get any better. Maybe you struggle with some addiction of some sort, you know, and you keep asking God to set you free from this addiction, but your, fra- your prayers don't seem to, you know, get past the ceiling, as we say. You're doing your best to make yourself believe that God has some purpose in all of this, but in your heart, you're wondering, where's God when I need him? Why hasn't he shown up yet? Doesn't he care about what I'm going through? I have to tell you that God's seeming absence is always amplified by the pain of calamity. But I want to reassure you that God has not forgotten you, just like he had not forgotten Lazarus or his sisters. He does love you, and he does have a purpose in in all of this. It may seem like God doesn't show up. It, It may seem like he didn't show up on time. You may be thinking like Mary had thought, Lord, if you had only been here. But God will always work out things in his own time. Not my time, not your time, but his time. He works them out. He's never late. He's never running behind. He always shows up at exactly the right time. The time by his watch where he knows the best good can come out of whatever you're going through. That's essentially what Jesus told his disciples. You know, before leaving for Bethany, Jesus told them in John 11, uh, 14 and 15, he said, Lazarus has died, but I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you can grow in faith. You see how important it is to Jesus that you and I grow in faith? He was glad he wasn't there at the death of his friend so that his disciples and everyone else who would witness this would grow in faith. See, God hasn't forgotten you. He has his priorities. We don't always have the same priorities. We don't share them. And so we don't understand when things don't go according to our preferences and our priorities. See, God wants to use even your pain to grow your faith. He wants to use it for that purpose because that's what's most important. Even through the pain of calamity, Jesus is working to develop your faith and hoping that you, like Mary, will also discover our second point, and that is 
the place of comfort. Curled up at the feet of Jesus, tears, you know, falling on his sandals, Mary had discovered a place of comfort. That's where she ran to for comfort. It's interesting that when practical-minded Martha went out to meet Jesus, nobody else seemed to budge. I mean, she just went out there ahead of time, right? All the friends and family just stayed behind in the house. All the mourners, all the people who were there to support, they just stayed behind. But when this very sad and sobbing Mary scrambled to her feet and ran out the door, what did everybody else do? They followed her. Now, to be fair, they thought she was going to the tomb to mourn. But they followed her. They saw the anguish on her face and they followed her. Verse 31 says, when the Jews had, who had been with her, with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. See, Mary was a mess. They could tell she needed their support at least. But she was a mess. For four days, she had probably, you know, gone back and forth between the house and the tomb dozens of times, you know, always seeking comfort, but never finding it. But this time, she wasn't going to the tomb. She was going to Jesus because she realized that he was there. He was there for her because Mary knew that at his feet she would find comfort and compassion. And she was right. Look at verses 33 and 35. They say, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit, and then verse 35, Jesus wept. See, Jesus felt her pain, and he wept with her. Jesus deeply loved Lazarus, and he wept over him, but he knew what was to come. And I would assert that Jesus' tears were mostly tears of compassion and sympathy for Lazarus' sisters. Now, it was also tears of sadness over all of the unbelieving world and those who would, who would not believe in him. And that brought him to tears too. But they were mostly tears of compassion and sympathy for Lazarus' family, for his sisters. There's comfort at the feet of Jesus. The most powerful comfort that you and I can give someone else may be who, who may be wrestling with the agony of death or divorce or disease or, or any other kind of distress, the most powerful comfort we can give is compassion, is being there for them. Have you heard this story? I know I've told it in, in other contexts before, but the story of the little girl who came home late from school. Uh, she was 15 minutes late uh, getting home, and her mother was worried sick. Just 15 minutes, but mothers worry, right? And when her mom asked her why she was late, she, ex she explained that, she was, uh, that it was show and tell at school that day. And her best friend, Jamie, had brought a very special China doll that her grandma had given her. And that was her show and tell. Well, when the two girls after school were walking home, a couple of boys began teasing them and being mean to them. One of them made Jamie drop her china doll and it broke on the sidewalk and said the little girl i stayed to help her so her mom said well that's sweet that you stayed to help her fix her doll fix her doll but the little girl interrupted her mom said no mommy i just sat down and helped her cry compassion right that's what jesus did for mary we live in a world of, of hurting people. Americans buy over 3 billion Tylenol each year. Did you know that? It's not hard to believe. Jesus knows every headache, doesn't he? There, there were 782,038 divorces in the United States last year. Jesus knows every heartache. He knows and he cares. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Does that make sense? Whatever trouble, whatever trials, whatever turmoil that, that you are facing, there is comfort at His feet. And that encourages us, that enables us, that empowers us to express and to share comfort and compassion with those around us. So go to the feet of Jesus. Go there. Fall at his feet in prayer, always, and lay your burdens down. And while you're there, keep in mind that amazing things happen at his feet. At his feet, Mary experienced the, the pain of calamity, and then she discovered the place of comfort. But we know how the story ends, don't we? If you've studied this story at all, we know that most importantly, she witnessed the power of Christ. After taking time to weep with Mary, we're told that Jesus came to the tomb where Lazarus was buried, and, and uh, it, it was a it was a cave with, with a stone laid across the entrance, right? Uh, just, just like the tomb that, that Jesus himself would soon occupy. And standing before the tomb, an air of authority swirled around him as he commanded in verse 38, 39. He said, roll the stone aside. Take the stone away. But remember how Martha protested in that same verse. Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell is going to be terrible. She had no idea what Jesus was about to do. Of course, she should have. Jesus had told her back in verse 23, your brother will rise again. You know, now Martha thought that Jesus was talking about the resurrection at his second coming that he had already taught them about. But Jesus had something much sooner in mind, didn't he? Verses 43 and 44 when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. You know, it's been said that, maybe you've heard this before, I have, that, uh, that if Jesus hadn't called Lazarus by name, Everyone in proximity to Lazarus, who was dead and buried, would have sprung to life. You know, obviously Jesus had the power to do just that, didn't he? But he was there specifically, purposefully, for Lazarus. He had a purpose in all of this. That's why he waited to, get, to come back, right? He may have wanted to raise everyone else from the dead, but his focus was on Lazarus. But that's the power of Christ. It's the power of resurrection, the power of life. A few years ago, there was a, a piece printed in Newsweek magazine. It was a letter from the Greenville County, South Carolina Department of Social Services that they found some, uh, that, that they had sent out, I guess. And uh, so it made its way to Newsweek. And uh, the letter read, To whom it may concern, your food stamp benefits will be stopped effective immediately because we have received notice that you passed away. You may reapply if there's a change in your circumstances. Well, now, other than Lazarus, there haven't been too many others who have seen such a change in those kinds of circumstances, have there? But there will be. That's the power and that's the promise of Christ. And then back to Martha. You know, if there was ever any doubt about Martha's relationship with Jesus, this little exchange in verses 25 to 27 ought to clear it up. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has to come into the world. Jesus has the power of resurrection and life, right? He is the resurrection. He is the life. 
Jesus has the power, for instance, to resurrect your marriage. He does. He has the power to call, call your career out of the grave. He has the power to breathe new life into your finances, into your family, and into your faith. But most importantly, Jesus has the power to resurrect you, and he will, if you are in him, if you have committed yourself to him. That's why Jesus arrived late to Lazarus' funeral. That's the reason. To prove that he really does have the power to raise us up from the dead and give us life forever. Not just in this life, but the life to come. He has that power. And that was the lesson in this exchange. The question is, do you believe that? Can you confess, like Martha did, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? That's what he's calling you to do. At the feet of Jesus, both Mary and Martha discovered the pain of calamity, the place of comfort, and the power of Christ. Amazing things happen at his feet. You could be wrestling with your own personal pain and calamity today. I don't know, you know what that might be, but you do. Come to the feet of Jesus. Turn back to him. Fall at his feet in prayer and discover a place of comfort. Share your burdens with him and let him weep with you. Well, that's our message today. Uh, next week, we're going to return once again to the feet of Jesus, where we're going to find Mary showing his worth. And uh, I think we'll be in John 12. I believe that's where this will happen. But I, I can't close without asking you if you've, if you've never made that confession like Martha did. But but you're ready to believe in Jesus. I, I can't close without asking you to accept his sacrifice for you, to commit your life to him through baptism, and to receive his gift of, of life forever. And if you want to do that, just, just let me know, and I'd be happy to help you with that. I'd be happy to help you get that done. So just make contact with me. However you, however you would like, contact the church office. You could email me at pastor.joe at wenatcheeadventist.org or you could respond to our Facebook page and uh, that message will get right to me and we can make contact. Let's get that done if you haven't done it yet, okay? Why don't we close with prayer? Lord in heaven, you are so good to us and what a compassionate, comforting God we serve. You are our friend and you love us deeply. And so often we don't understand why you do things the way you do. But Father, today uh, I know that your Spirit's goal was to encourage us to, to grow in faith, to trust you, to know that you have not abandoned us, you have not turned from us, that you are all about us. You are all about saving us. You are all about strengthening us. You are all about our eternal future. And so, Father, help us to trust you. Grow our faith, especially in the tough times. We look forward to that day when we can share heaven together with you and the new earth and just uh, uh, go back to the Eden that you always intended for us. In the meantime, Father, keep us faithful and may we always trust. We thank you for the time that we've shared together today and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you, you have a great rest of the Sabbath and a great week to come, and I hope to see you next week.